Hello and welcome to Western Civ. Today we cover roughly 3,000-ish years of Ukrainian history. Inspired by Professor Plochy and his excellent work, The Gates of Europe, link in the show notes for purchase, I decided to put together a truncated version of his work. By no means is this everything he covers in the book. If you want the full story, buy the book. It's excellent. Go buy it now. That being said, what follows is hopefully both a fun teaser and a deep dive episode that will cover a lot about a part of Europe we really haven't talked about very much. The first historian of Ukraine was Herodotus, strange as that might sound. Ukraine was then known to the Greeks as Pontus Eugenios, which means hospitable sea. Herodotus' detailed descriptions of the Scythians and the lands and the peoples they ruled made him not only the first historian of Ukraine, but its first geographer as well. Now, like many parts of the world, we know very little about Ukraine before the life and times of its first historian. We know that the lands to the north of the Black Sea were first settled around 45,000 BCE by Neanderthal mammoth hunters. By 4,000 BCE, Humans in the region began practicing sedentary agriculture and, by 3500, these same humans domesticated the horse, forever transforming life on the steppe. The Greeks first met the people of Ukraine when the Scythians displaced the Chimerians, who moved ultimately into Anatolia. These people became the quintessential barbarians, described as, quote, they are armed with the bow and spear. They are cruel and show no mercy. They sound like the roaring sea as they ride on their horses. They come like men in battle formation to attack you. End quote. By the 6th century BCE, the powerful city-states of the Greek world, especially Miletus, began to realize the wealth that could be made in the Black Sea and began to establish colonies on the Crimea. Herodotus divided the Scythians into many groups. Quote, Herodotus described the Scythians as divided into horsemen and agriculturalists each group occupying its own ecological niche in the northern Black Sea region. On the right bank of the Dnieper River, as viewed from a ship sailing southward, directly above the Creek colony of Olibia, from whose citizens and visitors Herodotus took most of his knowledge of the region. He identified a tribe called the Calypidae, probably descendants of the Greek intermarriage with local Scythians. To the north, along the Dniester and north of the steppes controlled by the royal Scythians, were the Alzinians, who, in other respects, resemble the Scythians in their usages, but sow and eat grain and also onions, garlic, lentils, and millet. North of the Alzinians, on the right bank of the Dnieper River, Herodotus located the Scythian plowmen who produced corn for sale. On the left bank of the river, he placed the Scythian agriculturalists, or Berenthesinites. He wrote that these tribes were quite different from the Scythians to the south, who inhabited the Pontic steppes and... 
He found that the lands along the Nipper River to be amongst the most productive in the world. Quote, the Berinthians, the largest of the Scythian rivers, is in my opinion the most valuable and productive, not only of rivers in this part of the world, but anywhere else, with the sole exception of the River Nile, with which none can be compared. Provides the finest and most abundant pasture by far the richest supply of the best sorts of fish and the most excellent water for drinking clear and bright, whereas that of other rivers of the vicinity is turbid. No better crops grow anywhere than along its banks, and where grain is not sown, the grass is the most luxuriant in the world, end quote. The Greeks could trade pottery, and especially wine with the natives of Ukraine, who in exchange gave the Greeks cereal, dried fish, and slaves. Obviously, the situation changed somewhat in the 3rd century BCE, when the Romans took control of the old Greek colonies. The Sarmatians then displaced the Scythians as the dominant steppe riders in the region. They ruled the steppe for around 500 years, until the 4th century CE and controlled the whole region between the Volga and the Danube rivers. While we know little about the Sarmatians, we can conclude that they were aggressive and skilled horsemen. They drove the Scythians into the Crimea, holding the Pontic steppes for themselves. With these changes, the region in general went into an economic decline, Quote, the city of the Berinthians, so to its size, does not correspond to its ancient fame because of its ever-repeated seizure in its wars. For since the city has lain in the midst of barbarians now for such a long time, barbarians, too, who are virtually the most warlike of all, it is always in a state of war. For that reason, the fortunes of the Greeks in that region reached a very low ebb indeed, some of them being no longer united to form cities, while others enjoyed but a wretched existence as communities. And it was mostly barbarians who flocked to them. End quote. The region never truly recovered from the days of Herodotus. Once the 4th century CE began, Relations between the Romans and the peoples north of the Danube decidedly changed. What had been a relation characterized by trade became one typified by war. This was the process by which Germanic tribes pressed into Central and ultimately Western Europe, displacing the Roman elite and ultimately leading to the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. Several key players in this story lived or passed through Ukraine, namely the Goths and the Huns. The Huns rose as the dominant power in the region until being replaced in the mid-6th century. However, by this time, one group in particular had come to Ukraine to stay, the Slavs. The Slavs were a conglomerate of tribes, which we really define in cultural and particularly linguistic terms. The Slavs first come to European attention in the early 6th century CE, when they show up in huge groups outside the Byzantine Empire. From the Danube, they begin to pour into the Balkans, creating a serious problem for the Emperor Justinian. Justinian tried the old divide-and-conquer strategy, effectively splitting the Slavs into their tribal groups and turning them against one another. One such tribal unit, the Antis, effectively became the northern border guard for the empire, having completely gone into the service of the emperor. This turned the Antis into Fodetari, official allies of the empire, 
Procopius, the famous chronicler of Justinian, wrote of the Slavs. They are semi-nomadic, living in pitiful hovels that they set up far apart from one another. They constantly change their dwelling places. Their bodies and hair are neither fair nor blonde, nor indeed do they incline entirely to the dark type, but they're all slightly ruddy in color. They live a hard life, giving no heed to bodily comforts and were continually at all times covered with filth. However, they were in no respect base or evildoers, but they persevered the Hunnic character in all its simplicity. For all these nations, the Scalveni and the Antes are not ruled by one man, but they have lived of old of a form of democracy, and consequently everything that involves their welfare, whether for good or ill, is referred to the people, end quote. He also wrote of battle, Quote, when they enter battle, the majority of them go against their enemy on foot, carrying little shields and javelins in their hands, but they never wear corslets. Indeed, some of them do not even wear a shirt or a cloak, but gathering their troughs up as far as their private parts, they enter battle with their opponents, end quote. Finally, of Slavic. Religion, quote, They believe that one God, the maker of lightning, is alone Lord of all things, and they sacrifice to him cattle and all other victims. They revere both rivers and nymphs and some other spirits, and they sacrifice all to them. They neither know it nor do they in any wise admit that it has any power among them. But whenever death stands close before them, either stricken or with sickness or beginning a war, they make a promise that if they escape, they will straightway make a sacrifice to the God in return for their life. And if they escape, they sacrifice just what they had promised and consider that their safety had been bought with this same sacrifice, end quote. The period of complete Slavic supremacy in the region came to an end in the early 7th century when the Avars arrived. The Avars did not remain on top long, first being replaced by the Bulgars and then the Khazars. By the end of the 7th century, the region had finally found some level of stability. Around the 6th century, the crucial city of Kiev became into being, finally. The Kiev chronicler wrote how the Slavic tribes west of the Carpathians created settlements that stretched from modern day St. Petersburg to the upper Volga region to the middle Dnieper. So to give you some context here, the Dnieper River runs through modern day Ukraine, cutting Kiev in half. The Volga runs through modern day Russia. So it's about 300 miles to the east from the nearest point to the nearest point. But both rivers, so you know, cut north and away from each other. So you need to imagine the space in between like a giant V. Archaeologists have now proven that these Western Slavs were more sedentary. The villages were built in clusters with a military compound in the center. They practiced agriculture and domesticated animals. Sadly, we just can't get more specific. But we know about the inhabitants of Ukraine in the 10th century and 11th centuries comes only from the enemies of those who lived in the region. To the Byzantines, these Slavs tended to just be another other, another type character made to fit in a box. Hence, it's not really worth reading their opinions. Across Europe, the end of the 8th century common era ushered in the beginning of the Viking Age, which would have profound impacts for Ukraine. Most scholars today 
believe that the term Rus, which we use to denote the earliest Russians, or I suppose people who will become Russians plus Ukrainians at all, was actually a Scandinavian word. It's probably derived from the Finnish Rustosi to denote the Swedes, the word meaning those who row. The Rus Vikings, a conglomerate of Norwegians, Swedes, and Finns, first came to Ukraine as traders, not warriors. The coming of the Rus to the region opened up a new trade network for the Byzantines, and the region took on importance that it hadn't honestly seen since the age of Herodotus. This time, the Byzantines traded silks for furs, wax, and, yes, still slaves. Over the 10th century, the Vikings and the Khazars fought a series of wars for the supremacy of the region, which ended with the domination of the Viking city of Kiev in 972 CE. From this point on, Kiev takes a dominant position in the region. When the ruler of Kiev died in 972, the rule of the powerful city-state fell to his two sons. Under their rule, one after the other, the Rus state of Kiev reached its height of power. With a unified system of government and a clearly defined structure, the Rus state of Kiev became for the first time a medieval kingdom on par with many of the German states to the west. Though what they really wanted to emulate was Byzantium to the south. In the course of the 10th and 11th centuries, as the Viking Age came to an end, the term Rus and Slav became more or less interchangeable. In 989, the Prince of Kiev accepted a Byzantine bride and in doing so, agreed to accept Christianity for the first time. Thus, 989 was a watershed year for Ukraine. After the ruler was baptized, Christian priests scurried around the countryside, hurriedly baptizing as many people as they could. Crucially, Kiev became an Eastern Orthodox city, much to the Pope's chagrin. This decision would have major ramifications for Ukraine for the next thousand years. After the conversion, the Patriarch of Constantinople created the Metropolitanate of Rus, an ecclesiastical province. The conversion to Eastern Orthodoxy tied the Rus and Kiev to the Byzantines, thereby opening up the region to the political and cultural influences of the Mediterranean world. Ultimately, it would prove faithful that Kiev not only brought the Rus into the Christian world, but made it part of Eastern Christianity. Many of the consequences of today were as important as they were at the turn of the second millennium. Well, one ruler brought Christianity to Ukraine, another, Yaroslav, who ruled from 1019 to 1054, transformed Kiev through a large-scale building process into a Christian city. The most striking project was the Cathedral of St. Sophia. The cathedral remains impressive to this day. It has five naves, five apses, three galleries, and 13 cupolas. The walls are constructed of granite and quartzite, separated by rows of bricks. Inside, the walls and ceilings are embellished with mosaics and frescoes. Construction was completed no later than the year 1037. Yaroslav's rule also marked the beginning of literacy, the Kievan Rus, adopting Church Slavic, specifically invented by Saints Cyril and Medotheus for the Slavs to be able to read and understand the Bible. Now the term Kievan Rus is much like Byzantium for that matter, a later invention. It does not appear in the historical record until the 19th century. <laughs> 
Today, when we say Kiev and Rus, what we mean is the society and state centered around Kiev from the 10th until the mid 13th century when the Mongols came calling. Kiev itself actually reached its high water mark during the reign of Yaroslav, after which the Kiev and Rus were beset by problems of succession coupled with the rise of other local political and economic centers, which challenged the right of Kyiv to lead a Slavic state. Yaroslav had five sons. His will dictated that they all receive some land, that the eldest brother would rule from Kyiv, and that he would be a kind of theoretical overlord. This idea of a divided realm between sons didn't work for the Franks, and it wouldn't work for the Slavs here either. In 1097, the system was revised with the intention that the throne of Kiev would only descend along the bloodline of Yaroslav's eldest son. This did not solve the problem of contested succession. Between 1132 and 1169, 18 rulers succeeded one another in Kiev. During the same time, major principalities on the periphery of the Kievan estate were growing in power. For instance, Novgorod in the northwest had become a center of Baltic commerce. As these principalities grew stronger, they increasingly asserted their independence from Kiev. But ultimately, none of this would matter. The Mongols were coming. On December 7th, 1240, the kingdom of the Kievan Rus came to a crashing end. On that date, the Mongols captured the city of Kiev, ending its dominance in the region. In many ways, this was a return to the status quo. The steppe riders of the region had long been dominant before the rise of the Slavs. So in that way, the arrival of the Mongols illustrates that the Slavic state of the Kievan Rus was sort of an interregnum between steppe powers. The Mongols ultimately recognized two main sources of power in their new Rus domains, Vladimir Zuzdal in modern Russia and Galicia Vladhinia in central and western Ukraine. Hence, the political unity of Kiev was gone. By the mid-14th century, the Mongol rule had come to an end in western Ukraine, where it also always had a lighter touch. In Russia, where the so-called, quote-unquote, Tartar yoke dominated until the end of the 15th century, Mongol rule was much more oppressive. But let's back up for a moment. In November 1240, the Mongols first appeared in Ukraine, approaching Kiev. Quote, and nothing could be heard above the squeaking of their carts and the bawling of Batu's innumerable camels and the neighing of the herds of the horses and the land of the Rus was filled with enemies. End quote. The Mongols used catapults to batter the walls and storm the cities. Kiev, like many cities sacked by the Mongols, was completely pillaged and left devoid of humans. An ambassador who passed through the once great city in 1246 on the way to see the Pope reported, quote, When we were journeying through that land, we came across countless skulls and bones of dead men laying upon the ground. End quote. Kiev was effectively removed from the map and would not regain its former prominence for centuries. But the reality is that 
even as Kiev was conquered by the Mongols, it had long lost its power and authority over the region. Indeed, Kiev had become a city dominated by outside influences, not a powerful city-state that dominated others. Thus, the status quo changed very little for Ukraine during the latter half of the 13th century. Other than the tremendous loss of life in Kiev and other urban centers, the Mongol touch was light, and most nobles in the region simply did as they pleased. The biggest implication of the Mongol invasions was the fact that now, for the first time, Ukrainians really did have to choose between East and West. The East represented Byzantium and the steppe. The West, the Pope, and the feudal kingdoms of the Holy Roman Empire. Ukraine lay smack dab in the middle and tried to negotiate a difficult balancing act that persists actually to this day. Throughout the 13th and 14th centuries, many parts of Western Ukraine joined the Kingdom of Poland. This made sense for the local elites who could then more effectively participate in the Polish government. Most crucially, they were then allowed to lobby their interests directly to the Polish king. The benefits of joining Poland, noble democracy, urban self-rule, the Renaissance, by the way, were outweighed for a few as the region lost its semi-independent status. Then in the first half of the 14th century, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania also started to play a key role in the region. Many Ukrainian elites ultimately picked Lithuania over Poland because its model of government allowed them to remain more independent. In 1362, Lithuanian and Rus troops defeated the Mongol Golden Horde on the Pontic Steppes. After this victory, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania became not just the obvious successor to the Kievan Rus, but the holder of most of the Ukrainian lands. The history of Ukraine really gets going at the end of the 14th century, when a series of agreements between the Grand Duchy and the Kingdom of Poland lay out the rights of the nobility living in the Ukrainian region. The Union of Lublin in 1569 is probably the most important accord because it created the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. But there are a few developments beforehand that do merit discussion. In 1413, the Union of Haroldo created a personal union between Lithuania and Poland. Now, now we've seen this before. For example, recall that Sicily was Frederick II's personal possession. He united it with the Holy Roman Empire upon his election to such, but his rule in Sicily was always personal. Now, the main issue with the Union of Hardrolo was that only Catholics were allowed to take part in the Union. Eastern Orthodox Christians were out, which drastically reduced the power of the nobility that remained Orthodox. Then, in 1470, the Grand Duke slash King abolished the Principality of Kiev. Thus, while Rus law and language remained well established, it lost its dominance. Polish language, for example, became the language of the Ukrainian nobility. The 16th century would see Ukrainian nobles continue to trade rights for security. Generally, this was due to the Grand Duchy of Moscovy. In 1476, Grand Prince Ivan III declared his realm, which was around Moscow, independent from the Golden Horde. By 1558, Ivan the Terrible attacked Livonia, a polity bordering the Lithuanian Grand Duchy, igniting the Livonian War, which would last for 25 years, and ultimately include Sweden, Denmark, Lithuania, and Poland. The capstone of the fighting came in 1563, when Muscovite troops 
took several key trading cities in present-day Belarus. Given the circumstances, in 1569, most Ukrainian nobles decided to incorporate their lands with Poland. Poland might be able to protect them from both Moscow and the remaining Tartars in the Crimea. This, by the way, was the aforementioned Union of Lubin that I talked about a minute ago. The Union of Lubin was, at first, a total success. Polish military support allowed the Ukrainian elite to push back against the Tartar threat, opening up more of the step to colonization and farming. This is the first time in the record that we see mention of Ukraine as the breadbasket of Europe, a title it would hold for centuries. And the opportunities, they weren't just limited to the elite. Eastward migration created a new economic and cultural opportunity slate for the Ukrainian Jews. Now, according to conservative estimates, the number of Jews in Ukraine increased more than 10 times from the mid-16th to the mid-17th century, rising from around 4,000 to more than 50,000. These people formed new communities. They built synagogues. They opened schools. But the new opportunities came at a price. The Jews of Ukraine were placed between two groups with opposing interests, the peasants and the landowners. Now, originally, both groups were Orthodox, but by the mid-17th century, with many princes converting to Catholicism and Polish nobles pouring into the area, the Jews oftentimes found themselves stuck between angry and resentful Orthodox serfs and money-hungry, greedy Catholic masters. And as we're going to see going forward, this was a powder keg waiting to blow. Yet the Union of Lublin did not completely rein in some oppositional aristocratic factions. These aristocrats were both encouraged by and aided by an ongoing cultural awakening on both sides of the Polish-Lithuanian border. These factions then used the space that the Union of Lublin gave them to enhance their own local prestige. In doing so, they began again to focus on their Slavic past and roots and began to think about an independent state of Ukraine. They would have to wait, you know, a few centuries for that. Many of the important changes, however, were taking place on the steppe. The steppe underwent crucial changes in the 15th and 16th centuries both political and economic. The biggest reason for this change was the collapse of the Golden Horde. In 1449, the Crimea became independent. By 1478, the remaining Khanate was a vassal of the state of the burgeoning Ottoman Empire to the south. The Ottomans were interested in the Black Sea region, not only for protection purposes, but for the same reason that any Mediterranean power had long been interested in that area. Slaves. Ottoman society was a slave-based society. However, Islamic law prevented the enslavement of fellow Muslims, so the Christian and sometimes still pagan steppe region to the north remained an attractive ground for slavers. The remaining Tartar clans turned now almost exclusively to slaving as their occupation. Estimates for the number of slaves brought to the Crimean slave markets in the 16th and 17th centuries vary from 1.5 to 3 million. The scar of Tartar slave attacks on Ukrainian society was felt for centuries, and it led to the rise of a new class of people the Cossacks. Who were the Cossacks depends almost entirely on what historical period we're talking about. We believe the initial Cossacks were almost certainly folk hero nomads from the steppe. They could be 
trappers, hunters, farmers, warriors, and sometimes bandits. Often the Poles and Lithuanians like to use the Cossacks in the 15th and 16th centuries to both harass the Ottomans and settle the steppe. There they could act as essentially free light cavalry. Now many Cossacks were either the descendants of Ukrainian peasants who fled their lord's manners to seek out better life on the steppe, or those who were coming from towns or villages, and just like those who went to the American West in the 19th century, were trying to earn a better life for themselves. In the 16th century, the term registered Cossack appears in the record, indicating a sea change in who was a Cossack and how they were treated. For the first time, elites established paid bands of Cossacks to fight their enemies, Ottomans, and often other Cossacks. Then in 1590, the Commonwealth Diet of Poland decreed the creation of an army of 1,000 Cossacks to protect the Ukrainian borderlands from the Tatars, Ottomans, and other Cossacks. These Cossacks then quickly joined others in a revolt, which the princes had put down in 1591. The princes, however, had limited control. There were many groups of Cossacks, and each band was free to elect its own leader, which said group might replace at any moment. So trying to figure out who to even deal with was difficult. Compounding matters, the early 1590s saw a series of bad harvests in the region, driving Ukrainians off manor lands and in to Cossack bands. Now, the Cossacks were not only an issue for the Poles and the Lithuanians. They could, and did, attack Moscow as well. In fact, in 1610, 10,000 Cossacks supported a pretender to the Moscovite throne. In 1614, a band of Cossacks attacked the Golden Horn in Istanbul. In other words, to an extent, they had become the Vikings of the 16th and 17th centuries. That being said, the Cossacks were not the Vikings in several key ways. First, they always remained an instrumental part of the Polish army. At the Battle of Koten, in 1616, the Cossacks helped the Poles push back a massive Ottoman army. Second, and more importantly, the Cossacks were into nation building and had significant social impact beyond mere military matters. After the Battle of Khotin, the Cossacks demanded titles of nobility for their officers and, many historians believe, common soldiers as well. This was an effort at recreating the social structure of Ukraine. Their efforts were rebuffed, and though they tried to take part in the Polish Commonwealth Diet in 1632, they were not allowed to. Said refusal came on the backs of several crushed Cossack uprisings in 1625, 1630, 1637, and finally, in 1638. After the 1638 uprising, the Polish elite were eager to find some way to accommodate, at the very least, the Cossack officer corps to prevent further unrest. Hence, they granted the Cossack Ordinance of 1638, which recognized the Cossacks as a separate legal entity with its own nobility. Crucially, the officers gained the right to pass lands and titles down to their sons. In return, the Poles got peace and the guarantee of hereditary military service. But as would happen time and time again, the Poles quickly learned that they could only take advantage of Cossack military might if they accommodated the Cossacks' social demands which was never an easy task. As the Cossacks were demanding more rights, 
Ukraine itself was undergoing a bit of a transformation. The issue in the late 16th century was the church, specifically the Eastern Orthodox Church of Kiev. The nobility in and around Kiev had long believed that the church positions in Kiev were theirs to dole out as they saw fit. This was a pretty consistent medieval issue. And what this meant was that most clergy did not care a lick for the souls of their parishioners. Moreover, the Eastern Orthodox Church in Kiev lacked the schools that their Western counterparts had, so their clergy were rarely literate and never had above an elementary education. In the late 16th century, the Kievan Orthodox Church began to institute a series of reforms to try to catch up with the West, which was right now going through the Reformation and Counter-Reformation. This all happened in part because of Cossackdom, the political entity formed by the Cossack Ordinance, provided stability on the steppe and space for those in Kiev to undertake reforms. Free from the Tartar threat, religious dissidents could now flee to Kiev. But it was more than that. In 1620, the Cossack leader, whom I will not name because I absolutely cannot pronounce his name, convinced the Patriarch to consecrate a new hierarchy in Kiev. Before this, the King of Poland had refused to appoint new bishops, hoping that the Eastern Church in Kiev would simply wither on the vine. Now the Patriarch stepped in and simply named a new hierarchy, bishops, etc. This decision, in turn, re-established Kiev as an ecclesiastical capital. Without Cossack intervention, I think it'd be fair to assume Kiev might have become a Catholic stronghold instead. Now, it would be a reinvigorated Kiev, not Moscow, that would play a crucial role in the Eastern Orthodox Reformation. But Cossack support was never all sunshine and rainbows. In 1648, the Cossacks rose once more in what would become known as the Great Revolt. The Poles had crushed the previous seven revolts, but this one quickly grew out of control. The Great Revolt eventually led to a new political entity that many scholars today see as the very foundation of the modern Ukraine. Now, the revolt itself grew out of a very simple dispute over land between a noble and a Cossack officer. Said officer tried to go through the courts after the noble wrongfully seized his lands, but to no avail. The so-called golden peace was over. The Cossacks quickly reached out to the remaining Tartars of the Crimea, who ultimately joined their rebellion. This was the crucial development, because the Tartars had horses. While the typical image today of a Cossack is a light cavalryman, in reality in 1648, most Cossacks were infantry. Hence, they needed the Tata cavalry. In May 1648, the Cossacks defeated two Polish armies, and in the Second Battle, the Polish army was nearly wiped out. Inspired by the victories, Ukrainian peasants stormed their lord's manors. While many Catholic priests were also attacked, the sad reality during this time was that those who suffered the worst were, predictably, the Jews. The Jews began to suffer en masse in June 1648, with estimates as to the number killed as high as 20,000. In 1649, the Cossacks again roundly defeated the Polish king in a battle which forced the Poles to sign an agreement effectively making a permanent and independent Cossack state in the formerly eastern palpitates of the Polish Commonwealth, Kiev, Bratislav, and Chernoviv. Together, these three palatinates formed what would become known as the Hetmanate and would form much of what became the modern-day Ukraine. The alliance with the Tartars had made the victory possible. This alliance then proved the Cossacks' undoing. In 1651, 
The Cossacks were beaten by the Poles after the Crimean Tartars deserted the field mid-battle. As a result, the Hetmanate was reduced to just the Palatinate of Kiev. But the real turning point in the rebellion was on January the 8th, 1654. In the town of Perislav, all the Cossack officers taking part in the rebellion came together and swore allegiance to the new sovereign of Ukraine, the Tsar of Moscow. Now, to be clear, no one in 1654 was thinking in ethnic terms about some grand Slavic state. However, the Soviet Union would, 300 years later, not see it that way. In 1954, the Soviet Union would celebrate the anniversary of what they called the reunification of Ukraine and Russia. Never mind that Russia would not become Russia until Peter I, or that no one at the time saw this agreement as anything other than a military alliance. To give you a sense of what the Cossacks were actually doing in 1654, here's a portion of the speeches. Quote, We have convened a council open to the whole people so that you, together with us, might choose a sovereign for yourselves out of four, whomever you wish. The first is the Turkish star, Sultan, who has often appealed to us through his envoys to come under his rule. The second is the Crimean Khan. The third is the Polish king, who, if we wish, may still take us into his former favor. The fourth is the Orthodox sovereign of the Great Rus, the Tsar, Grand Prince, Meleski Melikovich, the eastern sovereign of all Rus, whom we have now been entreating for ourselves for six years with incessant pleadings. Now, choose the one you wish. End quote. Ultimately, I think the right way to see this was just another religion-based alliance, like the other myriad religion-based alliances sweeping across Europe in the Reformation slash counter-Reformation era. After all, the Thirty Years' War had only just ended. The agreement was a contract. The Cossacks had just made Ukraine, well, really Kiev, a protectorate of the Tsar of Moscow. Now, the Tsar didn't see it that way. He thought he had a new group of subjects who, other than the normal rights, he could treat as he pleased. Regardless, the Cossacks now had what the Polish king had never given them, official recognition of their sovereign state. The joint Cossack-Muscovite force proved worth the treaty. Together, they smashed the Lithuanians and besieged their capital. By the fall of 1655, the Polish-Lithuanian counteroffensive was in tatters. The series of wars unleashed by the Cossack Revolt, began a period that historians refer to today as the Ruin. As you might expect, this was not a good time for Ukraine. The wars and the resulting famine dealt a huge blow to the political, economic, and social life of Ukraine. After the revolt, three powers, Poland, Moscow, and the Ottoman Empire, contested for the Cossack Ukraine. It didn't really matter which of these powers won in the end. No matter what, the Cossacks were bound to lose. And it was not just external foes. In June of 1658, Cossacks fought rival Cossacks near the city of Poltava in modern-day Ukraine. Close to 15,000 people died. And like with any other civil war, every death went against the country trying to save its own sovereignty. After the battle, one group of Cossacks signed a new agreement with Poland called the Union of Hadish, basically ditching Moscow for Poland. This new agreement not only satisfied Cossack social demands, but gave Orthodox Cossacks equal say 
with the Catholic Poles. Now, as one might expect, the Tsar in Moscow was none too pleased with this development and called on the Cossacks to reject this traitor. He followed up on this demand by marching a massive army to the Ukrainian border to crush the Cossack-Polish alliance. But if that was his goal, he was disappointed. In June 1659, the 70,000 man strong Muscovite army was crushed by the Cossacks and the Poles. Muscovite losses were over 15,000, with the bulk of their cavalry simply wiped out. For now, at least, the Tsar could do nothing about Ukraine. Yet the real problem here for the Cossacks was that each time they switched sides, they lost a bit more sovereignty. Eventually, the state that was once the Hetmanate simply split into two halves. On the eastern side of the Dnieper River, those Cossacks became part of Moscow. On the western side, the Cossacks joined Poland. The Treaty of Andrusovo made the final conclusion clear. Ukraine, as an independent territory, no longer existed. Not everyone agreed to this partitioning, though, and the Cossack elite immediately planned to stage a major uprising against Poland, with the goal of again uniting the Hetmanate. In the fall of 1667, the leader of the Western Cossacks was elected to the same position on the eastern side of the Dnieper. This time, the combined group decided to side with, wait for it, the Ottomans, believe it or not. In 1672, a 100,000-man army consisting of Ottomans, Cossacks, Crimean Tartars, Wallachians, and Moldavians moved against the Poles. The Poles immediately sued for peace and agreed to renounce their claim over the Western Cossacks. And then the same thing happened all over again. The relationship between the Cossacks and the Ottomans soured, generally for religious reasons. And the Cossacks once more tried to switch sides, this time back to the Tsar in Moscow. The final result of all this was that by the close of the 17th century, an independent Ukrainian Cossack state no longer existed. Until the end of the 18th century, Ukraine would remain divided between Poland and Russia. Kyiv remained a bit of an odd man out in all of this. Politically, it was part of Russia. Socially and culturally, it remained very much a mixed bag. During the late 17th century, the residents of Kyiv began trying to rewrite their history a bit. In 1674, while the city was preparing for an Ottoman attack, the first ever printed history of Kiev appeared. In this history, connections between Moscow and Kiev remained firm, even if sometimes the authors had to invent them. The relationship between Constantinople and Kiev, however, was now a bit awkward. Previously, the Kievan church resisted efforts by Moscow to dominate it. But with Constantinople now Istanbul, being dominated instead by a church technically under the political domination of the Muslim Turks, Kiev decided to switch sides. In 1685, the Kievan clergy officially switched to Moscow's jurisdiction, leading to the latter claim that Moscow was now the Third Rome, after Rome and Constantinople. In 1667, the remaining Cossacks began to referring to the Ukraine on both sides of the Dnieper River as the fatherland. This was a break from previous years, when the fatherland most generally meant the Commonwealth of Poland. As a part of this movement, the final effort to unite the former Hetmanate of Ukraine began in 1708, under the leadership of Ivan Mazepa. This ultimately failed, but brought about the little Russian identity still fostered by many Ukrainians. In 
Mazepa was the son of a noble Orthodox Ukrainian. He migrated from the Polish to the Russian side of the Dnieper relatively early in his military career in an effort to help unite the old nation. Unlike previous Cossack leaders, because of his support of Tsar Peter I, Mazepa was able to concentrate his power in both political and economic spheres, making him a much more formidable opponent. Mazepa's alliance with Peter came to a decisive end in 1708. At the time, Mazepa had been fighting alongside Peter the Great in the Northern War against Poland and Sweden. But when the war turned sour, so did relations between the two men. Peter wanted to pursue scorched earth tactics, which the Cossacks opposed. Then when Charles XII of Sweden marched into Ukraine, and Peter would not help the Cossacks defend their territories, it was all too much. The Mazepa switched sides. Thus began a war for the hearts and the minds of the Cossacks. Peter hoped to divide the Cossacks and win the territory back over to him through diplomatic means. It worked. Even some of the very men who convinced Mazepa to switch sides now deserted him for Peter. The matter came to a head at the Battle of Poltava in early July 1709. In the battle that pitted Sweden against Moscow, Cossacks fought on both sides. Though, to be fair, the rate was about three to one. For every Cossack with Charles XII of Sweden, three fought for Peter. Even without this disparity, Charles was badly outnumbered. In the past, this had never mattered to him. But in this case, with his army weakened after a winter in Russia, it was too much to overcome. The Muscovites won decisively. Out of the chaos emerged the identity which became known as Little Russian. While the Little Russians continued to assert Cossack independence, in some ways, what set the Little Russians apart was their intense loyalty to the Tsar of Russia. To an extent, this group exists in different forms in the Ukraine today. The last quarter of the 18th century changed Central and Eastern Europe, and as a colliery, Ukraine, dramatically. The cause of this change is simple. The rise of the Russian Empire, which dramatically entered the European scene as a major power in 1709, and only rose from there. Specifically, the Russians throughout the end of the 18th century steadily drove the Ottoman Empire back to its eastern and southern borders. Then, the Prussian, Russian, Austro-Hungarian, partition of Poland and Lithuania, ended those two territorial kingdoms and divided their lands and peoples between the burgeoning states on either side. Such was the way of the 18th century. It was a Darwinian world. Eat or be eaten. Ukraine, specifically the Hetmanate, vanished from existence as well. Peter I eliminated the position of Hetman, the ruler of the informal Ukraine, in 1722. The remaining Cossack elite slowly but surely found themselves becoming members of the Russian nobility, their peasants increasingly becoming serfs. While Catherine the Great stopped the recruitment of Ukrainian clergy into the Eastern Orthodox Church, recruitment of Ukrainians into the Russian military and civil service continued unabated. In 1787, Russian military victories over the Ottomans effectively closed the steppe as a frontier and extended Russian control over all of southern Ukraine. With the border closed, 
the Russians no longer needed the Cossacks as a counterbalance against the Ottomans, and now they wanted them out. Hence, the tail end of the 18th century saw mass efforts at colonization in southern Ukraine by the Russian state. Most of the immigrants, however, were foreigners. Mennonites from Prussia, Greeks, Bulgarians, and Moldavians from the splintering Ottoman Empire. These peoples, ironically, received land grants and tax breaks that most native Russian peasants could only dream of. While many of these new subjects fit seamlessly into the new Russian Empire, the Crimea was a different story. The Crimea continued to be home to the Crimean Tartars, who were Muslim. There was no place for them in this new Russian state, dependent as it was on autocracy and orthodoxy. By the end of the 18th century, over 100,000 Crimean Tartars had left the empire, choosing to settle instead in the lands that remained in Ottoman hands. Then, in 1793, the Second Partition of Poland united the eastern and western banks of the Dnieper River. Russian troops advanced, seized control of what little Polish lands remained, and united the balance of Ukraine with the Russian Empire. By 1794, Poland no longer existed. The partitions of Poland had two key impacts on Russia and Ukraine. Number one, Ukraine was once more united under a single political nation, albeit the Russian Empire. Number two, the percentage of ethnic Ukrainians in the Russian Empire increased from 13 to 22 percent. Hence, nearly one of four Russians were now ethnic Ukrainians. The unification of Ukraine led some to wonder, maybe one day if Ukraine might be its own sovereign state. As a result, many began to examine the cultural life of Ukraine. In the 18th century, a pioneering poet wrote the first major poetic work in history in the vernacular. The Ukrainian nobility began working in earnest to gather what materials they could in order to build the case for united Ukrainian heritage. These efforts only increased after the Napoleonic Wars and nationalism swept Europe, plus the great Polish uprising of 1830. St. Petersburg, however, was not having it. The Russian state preached a message of Slavic unity. In their Polish territories, the Polish language was banned. The Russian state poured resources into Kiev, which in the 18th century had hardly 35,000 inhabitants, trying to make it a bastion of Slavic culture. Its university now had but one goal, promote Russian influence. Thus, in the 18th and early 19th centuries, you have a definite push-pull going on in Ukraine, which persists to this very day. Russia wanted Ukraine to be more Russian. The Ukrainians, they were divided. But many wanted to see Ukraine as its own entity, free from overly aggressive Russian interference. If that sounds familiar today, well, it should. But not all Ukrainians lived in Russia. Some in Galicia lived under Austro-Hungarian rule. Between 1846 and 1847, within each empire, several groups formed to focus on the abstract process of Ukrainian nation building. The simple fact that this happened at all illustrates a sea change in the way in which at least the Ukrainian elite began to see themselves. To an extent, this was possible because unlike in Russia, 
the Austro-Hungarians, really Austrians at this point, never bothered to persecute the Ukrainian church or attempt to force ethnic homogeneity. The Austrians ruled a multi-ethnic empire that simply made such efforts fanciful. You know, for example, in March 1848, the Hungarians rose in rebellion. While with Russian help, the Austrians crushed said rebellion for the moment, the realities of Austria remained very different from those in Russia. The Hungarian rebellion had another upshot for the Ukrainians in Galicia. They had remained loyal, and so they benefited from the Austrian victory. Their hopes to partition the province of Galicia ended in the expected rejection. But the Ukrainians of Galicia emerged from 1850 with the Ukrainian newspaper and political organizations. These are things that those living under the Tsar can only dream of. In 1863, the Tsar, still smarting from another Polish uprising, banned all Ukrainian publications within the Russian Empire. Such simply didn't fit with Russia's views of its empire. Russia wanted this pan-Slavic state, and it was determined to have it. In 1873, the Tsar went further, banning all Ukrainian publications, even those not published within the empire, as well as Ukrainian language theater productions and public performances of Ukrainian songs. These efforts did not kill Ukrainian literature. Rather, they created a circumstance wherein most authors lived in Russia and most readers in Austria. By this time, Galician Ukrainians had effectively split into two groups, Russophiles and Ukrainophiles. Again, to a large extent, this split, it's not 50-50, it's not even close, but this split exists today. The connection between the Kyiv Ukrainophiles and those in Galicia grew over the years establishing an intellectual elite that tended towards the ideas of Ukrainian nationalism and away from the Tsar. Throughout the late 19th century, the Ukrainophiles slowly gained dominance over the Russophiles. Thus, while divided politically as a result of the partitions of the 18th century, Ukraine entered the 19th century more culturally unified than perhaps it had ever been. The late 19th and early 20th centuries saw dramatic changes to the Ukrainian economy as Russian peasants flocked to new urban centers across southern Ukraine, becoming the urban proletariat. The impetus for many of these changes from the perspective of St. Petersburg was the Crimean War. In September 1854, a joint British-French expeditionary force landed near Sevastopol on the Black Sea coast. So, the Crimean War in general was all about the future of the Eastern Mediterranean and the Black Sea in a post-Ottoman Empire world. Russia had for long dreamed of a warm weather port in the Black Sea and, truth be told, harbored deep ambitions to one day seize Constantinople. To the British and the French, this simply could not be. In 1855, the British and French defeated the Russians at Sevastopol in what looked like the precursor to World War I. Russia was then forced to sign the Treaty of Paris in 1855, barring them from having any military ports on the Black Sea. The loss was devastating for Russia, which quickly turned inward to see what needed to be fixed to ensure an outcome like this never happened again. The new Tsar, Alexander II, immediately set about it a massive, ambitious program to catch up with the West economically and militarily. The key to it all was southern Ukraine. If the Russians wanted to have a connection to any base in the Crimea, 
This is true, by the way, still today. They had to have railway lines in southern Ukraine. This is, interestingly, the impetus for Alexander's decision to sell Alaska to the United States. The Russian elite determined Alaska was too far away to do the empire any good, and, you know, they could fetch a good price. By 1875, the Moscow-Sevastopol line was complete. Now, again, to be clear, the Treaty of Paris did not require Russia to cede Sevastopol to anyone. They just weren't allowed to have a royal navy there. Railways in the 19th and 20th centuries were always engines of economic change, and nowhere was that more clear in southern Ukraine. Railways knitted Ukraine together as had never been done before. Grain could now be shipped with safety and ease to Sevastopol. Nomadic raiding disappeared. Kiev grew dramatically from 25,000 in the early 1830s to 250,000 in 1900. Odessa was even more dramatic, going from 25,000 inhabitants in 1814 to 450,000 in 1900. Ukraine had always been the breadbasket of Europe. Now, it was the industrial heart of the Russian Empire. As serfs were emancipated, they left their villages and filled the burgeoning cities. In 1897, the year of the first and only Imperial Russian census, over 17 million Ukrainians lived in Ukraine compared to 3 million Russians. In the cities, though, the numbers were much closer. In the industrial centers, roughly 1 million of each. One reason for the disparity was that the land-hungry Ukrainian peasants with the migrations were now able to get more of the land they so desperately wanted. Geographically, Ukraine shifted. The South was now the economic powerhouse and no longer the nomadic no-man's land it had once been. On January 9th, 1905, the Russian state went into revolt in what has since gone down in history as Bloody Sunday. The rebellion came to Ukraine three days later when the workers of a major factory went on strike. Peasants began illegally cutting down trees and raided the nobles' mansions in the districts they resided. The government stepped in quickly and brutally using the army to crush the rebellion by December 1905. But to be fair, the rebellion had all but ground down in late October, by which time the Tsar had graciously granted his subjects meager human and political rights. That being said, these concessions likely would not have occurred without the might of the Ukrainian Railway Workers' Union, which ground the crucially moscow Sevastopol line to a halt in early October. In 1900, Ukrainian elites founded the first ever Ukrainian official political party and issued its first pamphlet, Independent Ukraine, wherein the party listed independence as its number one goal. All of this, obviously, was completely illegal in the eyes of St. Petersburg, but it was still a first in terms of Ukrainian thinking. In 1905, these nationalist groups split into two factions, pro-national and pro-socialist. They both wanted each, an independent Ukraine and socialism. They just differed on the order of importance. These radical groups in 1906 began the publication of the first ever daily newspaper in Ukrainian, called the Rada, remember that name, by the way, is going to come back, which was now legal, by the way, thanks to the very recent czarist concessions of, again, 
basic political and uh, human rights. That all being said, when the elections for the third Duma were held in 1907, nearly all the Ukrainian seats went to native Russians, the pole of Russian nationalism remaining strong. In truth, the Ukrainian nationalists managed to accomplish much in 1905. For the first time really ever, the elites took their ideas to the masses and found that many Ukrainians agreed with the notion of an independent and unified Ukraine. But Russia, on the other hand, was not ready to accept any inklings towards independence. The system needed to undergo more shocks before it was ready for that. The first came in 1914. On June 28, 1914, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria was shot to death by Gavrilio Princip. The two shots that killed the Duke launched a global conflict that would ultimately reshape the world and, crucially for our story, end the Russian Empire. Remember that the First World War featured a contest between several multi-ethnic empires, and that did not bode well for any minorities in said empire. Ukrainians were no different. The Tsar immediately cracked down on the Ukrainians in the Russian Empire, turning back the clock to before the 1905 revolution. The Austro-Hungarians were no better. They rounded up all the Russophile Ukrainians and, ultimately, incarcerated around 20,000 for the duration of the war. Ukrainophiles, on the other hand, immediately declared their undying loyalty to the Austro-Hungarian monarchy and were spared a similar fate. The goal of said Ukrainophiles was twofold. Partition Galicia and achieve autonomy for Ukraine. The latter part of the idea assumed that the central powers would win the war, and hence an independent Ukraine would be carved out of what had once been the Russian Empire. The early stages of the war further altered the ethnic makeup of Ukraine. After some early successes, the Russians faltered in Galicia, and a joint austrian germany Armenia drove the Russians back. As the Russians retreated, most little Russians, native Russians living in Ukraine, followed their armies, leaving their homes forever. The key event for Ukraine, though, was in 1917, not in 1914. In February 1917, the Russian Revolution broke out. In Kyiv, the Ukrainians set up what they believed would be their own governing body, which they called the Central Rada. See? I said that name would come back. Most believed that this was the moment for Ukrainian independence and acted accordingly. The majority of the public agreed. They saw the only way for Ukraine to escape an endless cycle of war and economic deprivation as independence. But the Rada was not the people's only option. In cities, support for the Rada began to fall in October 1917, as support for the Soviets, which is the name actually for Bolshevik councils, rose. The Bolshevik coup in October 1917 triggered a number of responses across Europe. In Ukraine, the Rada immediately proclaimed Ukrainian independence, but tried to hedge its bets, saying it would remain in a federal-style union with Russia. For Bolshevik Russia, though, that wasn't enough, and they were never going to let that happen. In January 1918, Red troops streamed into Ukraine toward Kyiv, eager to proclaim Ukraine part of the Soviet Union. The Rada remained 
steadfastly committed to independence, but had lost the support of the industrial cities and lacked the troops with which to defend Kiev. On January 22, 1918, the Rada issued its final decree for independence. On February the 9th, it abandoned Kiev and began looking for new allies amongst the Central Powers. In exchange for grain, German armies rolled into Ukraine and threw the Soviets out of Kiev. When the Soviets signed the final treaty with the Central Powers, the Soviets were forced to acknowledge Ukrainian independence. But while independent of Soviet Russia, the new Ukrainian government found itself dominated instead by Germany. The Germans, fearing this new socialist Rada government might not deliver the promised grain, installed their own military strongman, once descended from a Cossack. Ukraine, it seemed, had substituted one superpower for another. His regime lasted barely until summer 1918. Unpopular with the Rada, a safe haven for Russian conservatives, and beset by strikes, his regime crumbled. On November 11th, 1918, World War I came to an end. The end of hostilities meant that the German and Austrian troops had to leave Ukraine, making it more vulnerable once more, even though it technically once again made it independent. The Rada rushed back to Kiev, but all the while they knew the Soviets were preparing a new offensive. Like everywhere else in Europe, Ukraine emerged from World War I shattered, culturally and economically. But for the moment, it was politically independent. On January the 22nd, 1919, the Rada once again proclaimed an independent Ukraine. Quickly, all thoughts turned to war. With the Soviets ready to invade, the Rada turned to its only reliable soldiers, those of the previously Austro-Hungarian province of Galicia. This force stood around 50,000 strong, but it was ill-disciplined and not in any way prepared to meet the Soviet onslaught. As a result, the Rada looked around for more allies, primarily England and France. These former allies of Tsarist Russia had thrown in their lot with the so-called White Russians who invaded Ukraine in early summer 1919. And so, even though they'd gotten out of the war in 1917, in 1919, Ukraine became once more a battleground. Poland was prepared to push its boundaries as close to the pre-partitioned ones as possible. The Whites pushed in from the South, backed in by England and France. And the Bolsheviks simply had to have Ukraine or their communist experiment be over very quickly. But the Bolsheviks had learned from 1917, when the Rada saw them as enemies, and they opened the door to Germany. Now, now it was different. Now Lenin said that Ukrainians must be accommodated. They needed to be allowed into the party, even encouraged to join. Lenin thought perhaps if they could co-opt the Ukrainian leftists, then they might get Ukraine without a fight. The new strategy worked. Throughout the 1920s, the Bolsheviks assumed and then consolidated their control over eastern and central Ukraine. But just outside Warsaw in mid-August, the Poles stopped the Bolshevik counteroffensive. The new treaty in October clarified the Polish-Soviet border, which ran from Belarus down the Dnieper to southern Ukraine. 
Crucially, the armies ended any Soviet dream of expanding their revolution into the heart of Central Europe. In March 1921, the sides once more signed a new treaty at Riga, Latvia. Once more, Ukraine found itself divvied up. Poland got Galicia, Romania got a chunk, the Soviets got a piece, and even the Czechs. Ukraine was now divided between four separate powers. The interwar period 1918 through 1939 proved disastrous for Ukraine. It was the largest nation in Europe with an unresolved national question. Two major movements would then define Ukrainian identity for the bulk of the 20th century. Soviet national communism and radical nationalism in Galicia. In December 1922, the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic initiated an agreement with Belarus, the Soviet Union, and the Transcaucasian states to form the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or as it's more commonly known, the USSR. Both Soviets and Ukrainians now embraced the idea that nationalism and social revolution could go in hand in hand. Ukraine got de facto autonomy out of the deal. In fact, Ukraine hadn't been this independent since before World War I. That would change in a hurry. In 1924, Lenin died. After a protracted power struggle, Joseph Stalin took command of the party in Soviet Russia. Stalin did not agree that autonomy and revolution could coexist. To Stalin, the Russians and Ukrainians were the same people, period. Any effort to distinguish between the two politically or culturally was against the ideals of the Soviet state. Those who did not fit in, namely the Jews, were encouraged to leave. Many did. That, however, was also because of the economic stagnation of the region in general in the years after the Great War. In the 1930s, the USSR would determine that it needed to combat this stagnation with immediate modernization, with disastrous consequences. After his 50th birthday, on December the 21st, 1929, a change seems to have come over both Stalin and the Soviet world. For the majority of the 1930s, Stalin and a small keep group of advisors made all the decisions in the Soviet Union. Their goal, like that of Tsar Alexander II in the 19th century, was to dramatically and quickly modernize the Russian state. Now, to understand what happened next, we need to understand two key terms, socialist industrialization and collectivization. The first term, socialist industrialization, refers to a Soviet-type industrial revolution. It's essentially a government paid for and run program intended to bring about a revolutionary increase in industrial productivity. Priority was always given to the development of heavy industry, especially production of energy and the building of machinery. The second idea or term, collectivization, really means the creation of a state-run collective farm system. The idea here was to take plots of land and distribute them to peasants in an effort to win their support for the Bolshevik cause, both during also and after the Revolutionary Wars. Now, the implementation of both these programs in the late 1920s effectively spelled the end of the new economic policy, which previously under Lenin had limited state control to leading industries and allowed market economy in agriculture, light industry, and services. The key to both endeavors was Ukraine. Ukraine. 
the USSR was massive, but we need to remember that close to 95% of the population lived in the European sphere of Russia, from the Ural Mountains to the West. Ukraine was only 2% of the USSR land-wise, but it contained about 20% of its population. The USSR invested a lot in Ukraine between 1928 and 1933, the first of Stalin's five-year plans. The South, as one might expect, was already industrialized, so it got the bulk of the cash investment, though a significant amount was spent in the North building military defensive lines. While the industrialization of Ukraine might have had a benefit, collectivization was absolutely not. In the late 1920s, Ukrainian peasants fled their homes. Why? Well, because Stalin turned the rural village into a living hell, oftentimes on purpose. Collectivization hurt the well-off peasants the most. These then had the tendency to revolt. Stalin and his henchmen were not opposed to using the Red Army to put down the revolts of these malcontents. Authorities could, and would, imprison these rebels and expel them from Ukraine. By 1932, around 70% of Ukrainian peasant households were collectivized, and Ukraine was producing about 28% of the total grain in the USSR. But the new policy also brought mass starvation, especially to the forest steppe zone. Most of the starvation hit the non-collectivized peasants, who couldn't hit their individual grain quotas. These quotas were designed to force peasants to collectivize. And if they did not, they typically starved. Also hard hit were the large peasant families who were collectivized, but who could not feed everyone in their family based on the allotment they were given. To make sure his orders were followed, Stalin seized control over the Ukrainian Communist Party apparatus and rammed his measures down their throats, often using secret police to accomplish his goals. Of the Ukraine, he said, quote, We should set ourselves the goal of turning Ukraine into a real fortress of the USSR, a truly model republic. End quote. These attacks on the peasantry, as we might expect, went hand-in-hand hand with attacks on Ukrainian culture. In December 1932, Stalin imposed completely unrealistic grain quotas on Ukraine. Close to 4 million people died. One of every eighth person between 1932 and 1934. In 2006, the Ukrainian parliament declared the famine a genocide, a man-made act of aggression intended to destroy the Ukrainian people. Coupled with Stalin's attack on Ukrainian culture and its political systems, I think it's impossible not to see it as such. Stalin did succeed in one right. He got to build the model Soviet Republic he wanted. Ukraine was now a model of Soviet industrialization and collectivization. 99.9% .9 of all farmland was listed as collective property. It was a great leap forward, but came with a cost. Between 1926 and 1937, the population of Ukraine fell from 29 to 26.5 million. It didn't stop there. Over 275 thousand people were arrested by secret police in Ukraine between 1937 and 1938. Over half of them executed. In 1938, Stalin sent Nikita Khrushchev to Ukraine with one final goal. Prepare a fortress to fend off the coming invasion. The invasion Stalin foresaw was from the Nazis in Germany.
and he was right. It was coming. Ukraine was the centerpiece of Hitler's Lebensraum vision for the future of Western Europe. After World War I, Germany lost most of its overseas colonial possessions. Lebensraum, or living space in German, was a policy intended to replace those overseas colonies with colonial holdings a bit closer to home. While Stalin's views of Ukraine were brutal, Hitler's were inhumane. Hitler wanted the space that Ukraine occupied. He did not want the Ukrainian people, which he did not see as fully human anyway. They were an inconvenience to be exterminated. As a result, between 1939 and 1945, Ukraine would lose 7 million citizens, close to one million of them Jewish. Now, long before the war with the USSR, Hitler dreamt of an alliance with England to eliminate France and with Russia to eliminate Poland. The pact with the British never came to be, but the Soviets agreed with Hitler to partition Poland 10 days before the Germans declared war on September the 1st, 1939. Stalin then actually delayed pulling through with his part of the bargain until German threats directed at Galicia led him to pull the trigger and invade. By October, Poland no longer existed. When Paris fell in June 1940, Stalin was shocked. Everyone in the USSR now realized that the Nazis were certain to declare war on them now that they had no Western Front. Hurriedly, Stalin moved Red Army troops into Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and parts of Romania. He needed a wall, and he needed it fast. Simultaneously, he deported political dissidents, including Romanians and Ukrainians, that he saw as problems. He needed to clear house fast, because most of his advisors assumed Hitler would declare war on the USSR in 1942. They were close. On June the 22nd, 1941, the Germans invaded along a front stretching from the Baltic to the Black Sea. Germany's army group south streamed into Ukraine. The Germans gobbled up territory like a starving dog inflicting devastating casualties on the retreating Red Army. The Germans quickly destroyed the fledgling Soviet Air Force and had complete control over the air. Retreating Soviet soldiers and fleeing civilians were mowed down from above as they ran for their lives. The Soviets took the only approach they could think of, scorched earth. As they fled, they destroyed everything of value evacuating 550 factories and moving 3.5 million skilled laborers east. Interestingly, in Ukraine, many welcomed the Germans due to Stalin's pre-war behavior. If they expected the Germans to be better, then they were quickly disappointed. Germany once more partitioned Ukraine into different military zones giving local elites no control whatsoever. Now, back in 1918, Germany was simply occupying Ukraine until it could establish a buffer state to Russia. But that was different. In 1941, the Germans came as colonizers who saw Ukrainians as subhuman, 
Prior to the war, Stalin had refused to sign the Geneva Conventions. Now, Soviet soldiers were treated as animals if they were captured, if they lived, that is. Many were simply shot on the spot as they tried to surrender. Remember, the goal for the Nazis was land, not people. More than 60% of people taken captive by the Germans died in captivity. The Nazis had never expected to take so many prisoners, and frankly, the more that died, the better from their perspective. It was not until very late in the war that the Germans realized the potential labor they could extract from these POWs. When one thinks of the horrors of the Holocaust, one thinks of Auschwitz, one thinks of concentration camps. But those were the reality for, by and large, Western Jews. Jews who lived in Ukraine, the Nazis saw as even less than that. They were hardly human at all. People were not deported to concentration camps in Ukraine. They were taken from their homes and they were shot, oftentimes in broad daylight. Moreover, unlike in the West, helping Jews escape was a capital offense. If you aided a Jew, both you and your family were executed, every single one. Again, I want to repeat, the Nazis wanted the land, not the people. Now, all that being said, many Ukrainians still tried to help their Jewish neighbors. Israel today recognizes 2,500 Ukrainian citizens as quote-unquote righteous among nations for their valorous conduct. Finally, starting in late 1942, the Nazis began exploiting Ukraine for forced labor. Around 2.2 million Ukrainians were caught, thrust onto trains, and taken to Germany to work. Many died of malnutrition and medical care. Those who survived were often sadly and ironically seen as traitors by the Red Army when they came liberating. Thousands of Ukrainians went straight from German forced work camps to Soviet gulags. Now, late 1942 is also when the war turned decisively against Nazi Germany. By September 6th, 1943, the Soviets recaptured Kiev. After the war, the Soviets would draw the new lines of Europe even further snatching territory away from Czechoslovakia as well. But not everyone was happy with the victory. As the Soviets moved west, they encountered an old foe, the Ukrainian insurgent army. Close to 100,000 men strong, this force fought behind the actual line of battle, which was in Germany in 1945 disrupting lines of communication and attacking isolated Soviet units. The Germans, for their part, supplied the insurgents known as the UPA with weapons, hoping to keep their enemies divided. When Stalin, FDR, and Churchill met at Yalta in February 1945, Stalin quickly convinced the Western leaders to legitimize his new boundaries. To curb Ukrainian resistance, Stalin deported 180,000 Ukrainians from western Ukraine to Siberia. The policy seemed to work. So in October 1947, he deported another 76,000. Stalin moved populations with the express purpose of fighting nationalism. His goal was clear from the start. Ukraine was the gateway between east and west, and the gate had to be shut. Another of Stalin's key legitimizing strategies for the USSR 
was to make sure that Ukraine was admitted to the UN as a founding member in 1945, which it was, giving Ukraine immediate legitimacy. Being part of the UN was nice, but after the war, most Ukrainians probably would have traded the plaque for some food and other basics. The war had been awful to Ukraine. Seven million people were dead. 10 million more were homeless. 40% of its wealth was gone. 80% of its industry destroyed, reducing its output by 75%. This was a huge problem for Joseph Stalin because Ukraine was supposed to produce the arms and equipment needed to fight against capitalism in the West. A fight, by the way, I mean an actual war, he assumed would begin any day. Thus, The first decade after the war was largely spent rebuilding Ukraine's shattered economy. But things had changed. The Great Patriotic War, as the Soviet-German War of 1941 to 1945 became known in the Soviet Union, USSR, provided new legitimacy for the regime because it had managed to survive, you know, and repel a foreign invasion. But the same war had also changed everything. It changed the political landscape of the Soviet Union. It gave people agency to a degree that hadn't been seen since the revolution of 1917. Moscow's efforts to reimpose ideological uniformity and a degree of central control that existed before the war were after the war ever only partially successful especially in a republic like Ukraine, where national resistance to the Soviet regime continued unabated. At first, the leaders of the Ukrainian insurgent army continued to challenge Soviet rule. Avoiding large-scale engagements, the UPA now fought only small battles and relied mostly on ambushes. Essentially, they were merely trying to keep the fight going until the expected war between the East and West broke out. It took the Soviets until spring 1950 to really crack down on the insurgents. But after that, the insurgency was basically crushed. On March 5, 1953, Joseph Stalin died and was replaced with Nikita Khrushchev. While Khrushchev might have once been a Stalin loyalist, he realized Stalin's legacy was overwhelmingly negative for a huge section of the USSR, including, to be fair, many in Russia. He claimed that the days of Stalinist purges were over and began the long process of rehabilitating many of Stalin's political enemies, including many Ukrainians. Khrushchev was a firm believer in communism as a theory. Were all things equal, Khrushchev maintained, communism would always win. He founded a new party program of construction intended to lift millions out of poverty. He was also adamantly opposed to religion and started a new wave of persecutions against the Eastern Orthodox Church. Khrushchev, in this way and in others, wanted a return to Leninist norms, which to the younger members of the party was code for no more purges. That, by the way, they liked. His reforms contributed to the massive expansion of Soviet industry and the increasing urbanization of society. Khrushchev, specifically, became famous for the Khrushcheveki, a five-story concrete urban dwelling, inescapable, in most former Soviet cities today. At the time, they were a wonder, allowing millions to move out of temporary shelters. And of course, many resources went towards building a Ukraine that could finally begin to look forward with some amount of hope. In March 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev came to power. He had no ties to the Ukrainian party machine, 
nor any to Ukraine in general. And time would quickly prove how little he actually cared for the Soviet Union's most important satellite state by a mile. On April 26th, 1985, the fourth reactor of the Chernobyl power plant exploded. The few Ukrainians invited to take part in the discussions that followed about what to do had little say and certainly weren't allowed to vote. When the wind shifted and the radioactive clouds moved towards Kyiv, the authorities in Moscow refused to cancel a parade scheduled for the next day. So little did they care about the people. The radioactive fallout directly impacted 2,300 settlements and more than 3 million people. Worse still, the fallout endangered close to 30 million people who relied on the Dnieper River. It was a disaster of global proportions, but felt nowhere worse than Ukraine. The Chernobyl incident drove yet another wedge between the party officials in Kyiv and in Moscow. While Moscow worked to clean up the disaster, Gorbachev began a policy of economic restructuring. He called Perestroika. Along with economic plans, Gorbachev wanted to decentralize control, giving more power to party bosses and their locations to make local decisions. This gave Ukrainians more power and control over their autonomy. Defense of national culture was also high on their list of priorities. Founded in 1989, the Society for the Protection of Ukrainian Language had over 150,000 members by the end of the year. The society essentially wanted to reverse the policy, followed by USSR and Russia before it. It actually wanted the 25% of those living in Ukraine who didn't speak Ukrainian to do so. This was an uphill battle and continues to this day. In the summer of 1990, Western Ukrainians organized a march to the East, whose purpose it was to awaken a sense of Ukrainian purpose in the East. Ultimately, it was a great success. Free elections in 1989 also gave the Ukrainians more of a sense of purpose. Gorbachev even took the step of legitimizing the Ukrainian Catholic Church, long banned even since the days of Stalin. Now, things really start to get going in October of 1990. On October 2nd, 1990, dozens of students began a hunger strike in downtown Kyiv. Their goal was independence. At this point, Gorbachev was struggling to keep the union together. Gorbachev suggested a looser union, especially after failing to stop the independence drive of Lithuania and Estonia, even by force. But Ukraine was not prepared to sign on unless they could join on their own terms. Matters now began to spiral out of control. On October 19th, 1991, a conservative group tried a coup to force Gorbachev to resign. When he refused, they demanded he institute martial law. He refused again. Ultimately, Gorbachev had little choice but to step down to be replaced ultimately by Boris Yeltsin. Under Yeltsin, the plan was to change. There would be no sharing of power. Russia was going to be in charge. End of story. But by summer 1991, Ukraine was on its way out. On August 24th, 1991, the Ukrainian parliament held a vote on independence. The results were clear. 
346 voted in favor, only two against. The crowds outside the parliament building were jubilant. Yeltsin became concerned over the actual possibility of Ukrainian secession. To try and force the issue, Boris Yeltsin indicated that if Ukraine left the Union, then Russia would open the question of borders, seeking both the Crimea and the Donbas Gol region. In September 1991, all six candidates running for the office of the presidency were running on a platform of independence. Then, on December the 1st, 1991, Ukraine voted on the issue, turnout reached nearly 84%, and 90% of the votes cast were for independence. After a last-ditch effort to placate Ukraine and keep it in the USSR, it officially left the Soviet Union. Absent Ukraine, Russia could no longer ethnically outvote the other Muslim republics that made up the bulk of the rest of the Soviet Union. Therefore, on December 25th, 1991, the Soviet Union ended, though the USSR left behind not only an economy in ruins, but a socioeconomic infrastructure, army, way of thinking, and political and social elite bound by a common past and shared political culture. The entity that would ultimately replace the vanished empire, whether it was a community of, you know, truly independent states or just a reincarnation of Russian-dominated policy, was anything but a given. Despite the uncertainty, Ukraine was ready to start its life independently. On December 20th, 1991, the Ukrainian parliament issued a statement emphatically declaring its autonomy, quote, According to its legal status, Ukraine is an independent state, a subject of international law. Ukraine opposes the transformation of the Commonwealth of Independent States into a state formation with its own ruling and administrative bodies, end quote. In January of 1993, Ukraine declined to join the Commonwealth of States Russia was working to create, essentially maintaining the social and economic unity of the former Soviet Union. By spring 1992, the Ukrainian takeover of the formerly Soviet army in Ukraine was complete. In that case, the officers had the choice to swear allegiance to Ukraine or leave and move to Russia. Henceforth, new conscripts came from Ukraine alone. The transition of the Black Sea Fleet turned out to be much more complicated. By 1995, only 18% of the fleet had completed the transition, and Russia still held on to Sevastopol. Russia maintained, in fact, 25,000 seamen in Sevastopol until 2017. By the end of the 1990s, Ukraine had settled its territorial issues and established the diplomatic foundations for its incorporation into Europe. Ukraine became one of the first post-Soviet regimes to initiate diplomatic relations with the West in 1994, when it gave up all the nuclear weapons it had inherited from the Soviet army. This, by the way, was not an insignificant concession. At the time, the Ukrainian army possessed the third largest nuclear arsenal in the world. This move also entitled the Ukraine to U.S. aid, which it received in such a high amount that only the nations of Israel and Egypt received more American aid at the time. Also, in June of 1994, Ukraine signed a cooperation agreement with the EU, the first post-Soviet state to do so. Throughout the 1990s, Ukraine became a model post-Soviet state as a bastion of democracy. Power transferred peacefully through elections. The geographic rivals of East, West, North, and South produced several strong and viable parties. Such was the balance of power that no one political group was able to dominate, forcing all to accept compromise as the cost of doing business. By the late 1990s, however, the Ukrainian state was facing 
a political challenge brought about by an economic collapse. Between 1991 and 1997, Ukrainian industrial production fell by 48%, while domestic GDP tumbled by 60%. These losses were more significant statistically than American losses during the Great Depression. Many decided to leave the country between 1989 and 2006. Over 1.5 million Ukrainians emigrated, many to Russia. The problem was how to transition out of a state-run economy. It was hard to privatize large corporations because those corporations were run by the old guard who, by and large, won seats in parliament and wanted to keep their monopolies. By 1999, close to 85% of all businesses in Ukraine were privatized. But those, crucially, only accounted for around 65% of the total industrial output of Ukraine. Thus, most of the big businesses were still state-owned and managed. Most of the privatization of Ukraine's major industries took place between 1994 and 2004 under the watch of President Leonid Kuchma. While successful, Kuchma became yet one of many Ukrainian politicians befuddled by scandal in the early 2000s. While Kuchma favored diplomatic ties to Russia, many Ukrainians wanted closer ties with the West. To them, a young rising star, Viktor Yushchenko, was the man of the future. Yushchenko was a reformer who in 2001 as prime minister worked to close loopholes that allowed the oligarchs to avoid taxation. The 2004 presidential election was essentially a question of reform versus status quo of East versus West. Yushchenko was the reformer and the, and the candidate who supported closer ties with Western Europe. His rival was Viktor Yankovic, who was heavily supported by Russian President Vladimir Putin. Yushchenko was winning the race by a substantial margin when he suddenly fell terribly ill, raced to Vienna, the doctors there came to a shocking conclusion. Yushchenko had been poisoned. Moreover, the specific neurotoxin could not have been produced in Ukraine, but it could have been in Russia. Relying on pain medications, Yushchenko returned to the campaign trail, still leading the polls by nearly 10%. Yet on election day, most Ukrainians we're in for a shock. According to the media, Yankovic, not Yushchenko, had won. Later evidence proved, however, that Yankovic had tampered with the servers to falsify the election results. Pressured significantly by the West, Ukraine held another election on December 26, 2004. This time, Results matched the polling. Yuchenko had won. Yuchenko desperately wanted Ukraine admitted to the EU. But in 2004, the EU was no longer ready to accept more former Soviet states and instead voted for closer cooperation, not admission. Moreover, while Yuchenko's Ukraine was more economically productive, it was not a fair place to do business, and the rampant corruption continued in many industries. The inability of the regime to fix Ukraine's myriad issues led voters to select Viktor Yankovic, the guy who had tried to fix the election in 2004, over Yushchenko, only a few years later. Yankovic favored an authoritarian regime with closer ties to Russia. He forced the parliament to amend the constitution, granting sweeping new powers to the president. 
Then he jailed his political opponents and concentrated power and wealth in the hands of his extended family. By 2013, Yankovic and his family had effectively embezzled 70 billion, billion with a B, dollars from Ukraine, threatening any chance the state might have of surviving. But Yankovic might have survived had he gone through with the association agreement negotiated between Ukraine and the EU, which was immensely popular with most Ukrainians. But he did not. On November 28th, 2013, at the actual signing ceremony, Yankovic refused to honor the agreement, infuriating many European politicians and Ukrainians. The students in Kyiv were the first to protest. When Yankovic brutally put down their protests, the balance of Kyiv poured out into the streets. Between December the 1st, 2014 and mid-February 2015, Kyiv was a virtual war zone. Sniper fire took out protesters. Between February 15th through the 18th alone, 77 people were killed in Kyiv. 68 protesters and nine police. On February 21st, with the walls closing in, President Yankovic fled Ukraine. Russia, however, wasn't having it. Immediately, President Vladimir Putin initiated a trade war with Ukraine, further devastating its economy. Then on February 26th, less than five days after Yankovic fled the country, armed Russians took control of the Crimean parliament, instituted a pro-Russia government, as an aside, the pro-Russia party had only won four, yes, that's four, percent of the vote in the last election. Regardless, the armed Russians laid the groundwork for a Russian takeover. While Ukraine was struggling with the disasters left by the disgraced Yankovic, Putin cut off Ukrainian TV channels in the Crimea and kidnapped many of the Crimean Tartars who opposed union with Russia. In mid-March, the citizens of Crimea were herded to polling locations to vote on reunification. The Kremlin quickly claimed that 83% of registered voters had voted, and, believe it or not, 99% of them had voted to reunify with Russia. The real turnout percentage was about 40%. And some other Russian figures were, let's just say, a tad dubious. Take Sevastopol, for example where turnout, according to the Kremlin, ran as high as 128% of registered voters. At least that's what Putin claimed. The very next day, the Russian parliament voted to restore the Crimea, putting an end to the travesty, according to Putin, that had taken place in 1991, when the Crimea was so wrongfully stolen from the USSR. The Ukrainian government in Kyiv never accepted the results of the referendum, but nor could it do anything about it. From the Crimea, Putin turned his attention to the industrial Donbas region in southern Ukraine. In 2014, Russian efforts to destabilize the region began. Paramilitary forces trained in Russia had taken over most of the region's urban centers by April 2014. Once again, Ukraine found itself torn. Most Ukrainians favored closer relations to the West, but an aggressive group wanted to restore the glory of the Soviet Union. It was the same old East-West contest that had been going on in Ukraine since time immemorial. To an extent, Russian efforts backfired. In 2014, the share of Ukrainians who wanted to join Russia fell from 10 to 5 percent. Those student protesters in Kyiv now signed up for military training, 
to combat insurgents in the Donbas region. Russia responded by doubling down. In early September 2014, Russia began sending in actual military units for the first time to fight alongside mercenaries. This, along with the downing of Malaysian Flight 777 by Russian missiles, galvanized European leaders into action. First, European leaders from France and Germany tried to get Russia to agree to a ceasefire, which Russia did twice, but it didn't make any difference. The fighting continued. In February 2015, Germany and France intervened in the conflict, but the best they could do was hold off Russian forces long enough to allow the Ukrainian army to continue to retreat. But ultimately, Russia failed to seize enough territory to create a land bridge from Russia to the Crimea, which was clearly its ultimate goal. Ukraine strengthened its ties to the West, but the battle was far from over. Ukraine's heroic defense of the Donbas region between 2013 and 2015 against the supreme military weight of Russia did buy it time. Two new presidents since have tackled the crucial issues of reform while continuing to pursue stronger relations with Western Europe. One of the most crucial reforms in 2019 was the Hamrad D system, and I probably mispronounced that. Under this new system, taxes were essentially decentralized, giving each locality the right to spend their tax dollars as they wished. A norm for the ages in the EU, Ukraine was catching up. By 2016, the Ukrainian military was growing at leaps and bounds, going that year from 140 to 250,000 strong. But the numbers, they never would have been enough not without significant aid from the West. America alone contributed $1.6 billion in security assistance over the first four years of the conflict. Critically, American aid allowed the Ukrainian army to use quote-unquote javelins for the first time. Javelins, in a modern military sense, are handheld anti-tank missiles that can be carried by individual soldiers. With the javelins, the Ukrainian army stood a much better chance against the Russians. Western aid also allowed Ukraine to reform its banking system in 2015. Previously, Ukrainian banks functioned as little more than ATMs for their owners. As a result of all the reforms, the number of Ukrainian banks operating dropped from 185 to 85. But those that remained functioned as, you know, actual banks. Oligarchs also generally lost power during this period, as their overall share of the wealth fell dramatically. The Ukrainian economy has remained in rough shape, however. Two million Ukrainians left in 2016 to find work outside Ukraine. Ukraine exports 26% of its products to Russia, making conflict with the Kremlin economically precarious. Moreover, Ukraine remains dependent on Russia for its energy. By 2020, the unfinished war in the Donbas had claimed 14,000 casualties on both sides. No country remains more important to the continued sovereignty of Ukraine than the United States. This means, as Americans found out during the first impeachment trial of President Donald Trump in 2019-2020, that Ukraine might function more prominently in U.S. domestic politics. But... For the United States, the choice is stark. Support Ukraine or face another Iron Curtain. Ukraine, as we have seen throughout this episode, 
has always been where East met West. Question remains, which way will it go?